Good morning. My name's Peter, and I'm a member here at Moreland's Church. The reading this morning is from Philippians chapter 4, and we'll be reading from verses 10 through to 23. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I'm amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Thanks so much, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Uh, do keep that passage uh, open, and there's a, uh, an outline on the inside of your uh, notice sheet if you want to take any notes. Uh, last Sunday, one of our elders, Andrew Blaine, led our Sunday morning meeting. He's looking a bit nervous. Don't worry, Andy. It's okay. Um, at one point, about, he was talking about what it meant to be a Christian, and he used a very interesting choice of words. He said that a Christian is someone who is obsessed with Jesus. I've been thinking a lot about this word uh, this, this week. I wonder if that's how you would describe yourself. I wonder if that's how others would describe you, which is a bit obsessed with Jesus. Probably if others do describe you that way, you wouldn't know about it because it's not the kind of thing you say to someone's face, is it? And that's because we don't tend to think of being obsessed as a very good thing. We tend to worry about a little bit about obsessive people, don't we? People who are so focused on one thing that it becomes an all-consuming passion such that they can't stop talking about it. Think of the work-obsessed person who never stops to rest, never has the chance to spend the money they're making, neglects their family to advance their career. We think, that's not good. That person is making their life unnecessarily stressful. They're missing out on good things. They've got their lives all out of proportion. Or perhaps we think of someone who's obsessed with a particular relationship, such that another person, another human person, has become all they think about and all they live for. And again, we think that's not very wise. That doesn't sound very healthy. Because if that relationship breaks down, you'll be destroyed. Or perhaps we think of uh, someone who's obsessed with a particular hobby and spends all their free time spending time and money on it to the neglect of everything else. We might question whether that person has really got their priorities straight. 
why they're a little bit slightly crazy to be devoting their lives to something so trivial. So, if our elder Andrew is right to say that Christians are those who are obsessive about Jesus, is that a good thing? Is there any difference between this obsession we have with Jesus Christ and other obsessions we might develop? Isn't being obsessed with Jesus something unwise and unhealthy? Doesn't it make us a little bit crazy, a little bit out of touch with reality? Doesn't it bring us stress and anxiety? Doesn't it mean we're missing out on other good things? Well, here we are at the end of Paul's letter to the Philippians. He's been speaking all the way through about what it means to be, as we've been calling it, all in for Jesus. Another word, I suppose, for being obsessed with him. He's been commending the Philippians for their commitment to Jesus. He's been encouraging them to keep putting their whole weight on Jesus in every area of their life. Last week, we saw that they were to fill their minds with thoughts of Jesus at all times, that they were to talk to Jesus in prayer about absolutely everything, that the gospel of Jesus was to govern their behavior in absolutely every sphere of their existence. And now at the very end, Paul points to another example of the Philippians' commitment to Jesus, their obsession with him, their all-in attitude towards him. The Philippians have been sending Paul money to support his ministry of telling other people about Jesus Christ. Now, it's nothing perhaps so very unusual in that. Many of us give money to causes we support and believe in. But Paul here says the Philippians have been extraordinarily, exceptionally eager to give. He says in verse 16 that they've given on multiple occasions again and again. He implies in verse 10 that they would have given more if they'd had the opportunity, but uh, that they've been champing at the bit, wanting to give, and slightly frustrated that they couldn't. He says in verse 15 that from the very, very beginning of their Christian lives, they were unusually generous. Even uh, in the standards of other Christians around them, they were very unusually generous. The preacher John Wesley once said that the last part of a man to be converted is his wallet, probably usually true. Not so for these Christians. They were financially all in from the very start. He says in verse 14 that by giving him money, they were sharing his troubles. Remember, Paul is an imprisoned man suffering under persecution for his own obsession with Jesus. And by supporting Paul financially, the Philippians are siding with him, putting themselves under suspicion, opening themselves up to accusation. And we learn from other parts of the Bible, from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, that the Philippians were not rich people. In fact, quite the opposite. In 2 Corinthians, Paul describes them as undergoing a severe trial and living in extreme poverty at the moment that they gave. They were poor, they were persecuted, and yet they gave abundantly again and again and again to Paul's mission. We might think, well, here is a clear-cut example of unhealthy, unwise obsession. We all know how stressful money troubles can be, and here are poor people impoverishing themselves yet further for Jesus. This is crazy, isn't it? How are they going to live? Isn't this going to make them miserable? Isn't it going to make them stressful and anxious? Isn't this going to mean that they miss out on good things that they could have used their money for? Isn't this all just going too far? Well, Paul wants us to know that if we think like that, we've got something fundamentally wrong. He's going to teach us here that being all in for Jesus, like the Philippians, like Paul himself, is the sanest, most joyful, least anxious life it's possible to live. This obsession is thoroughly healthy and completely wise. It brings contentment, it brings joy, it leads to glory. And so my hope as we study this passage together is that all of us, wherever you are with Jesus, if you're not a Christian yet, or if you've been a Christian for many years, or you're somewhere in between, all of us will become more obsessed with Jesus, put more of our weight on him, be more all in for him and his plans for our own good. Well, let's see together how that can be true, shall we? First, we're going to see that being all in for Jesus brings contentment because God strengthens us. Look at verse 10. Where Paul says this, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you've been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him 
who gives me strength. The headline to the section is there in verse 10. It's Paul's great joy that the Philippians have sent him money. And it's no surprise to find that joy is on the agenda. We've grown used to that in Philippians. If you haven't uh, been with us, that's been a huge theme of Philippians, the idea of joy. Philippians is a letter saturated in joy. Paul is joyful when he thinks about and prays about the Philippians. He wants them to grow in joy. He even commands them to rejoice, as we've been thinking about already this morning. And here Paul tells the Philippians something that has brought him joy. It's the arrival of a financial gift from the Philippians brought to him, as we learn in verse 18, by that faithful Philippian servant, Epaphroditus. So Paul is happy because he's received some money. Well, okay, that's hardly surprising, is it? Well, we all enjoy opening the birthday card and catching the check or the banknote as it falls out. It happens less often as you get older, but it's still quite fun, and it does. Uh, we all feel a sense of relief and happiness when we check our bank account and see we've been, we've been paid this month. Okay, good. But clearly, Paul is describing something very different. For a start, we might think his expression is a bit over the top. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. In the whole of the rest of the New Testament, that expression is only used on three other occasions. The birth of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and the conversion of the first Gentiles to Christianity. And getting some money in the post. It feels like it doesn't quite fit, does it? Those first things are fairly big, one-off, marquee events, aren't they? But this is much more, clearly Paul feels much more than the kind of surprised, relieved, general feeling a bit chuffness that we experience when some money comes our way. We'll see why he's rejoicing so greatly in a moment. But there's another, re another reason that Paul's reaction is perhaps a little different to ours. We tend to feel pleased or relieved when we receive money because it meets a need. We need to pay our bills. We need to fix the hole in the roof. We need to buy new shoes for the kids. Where's the money going to come from? We're feeling a little bit anxious about it all. Ah, but it's okay because the tax rebate came through or whatever it is. And so we're happy because the money will materially change our circumstances for the better. But Paul wants to make it very, very clear that is not why he's rejoicing. He says in verse 11, it is not because I'm in need. Now remember, Paul is in prison in Rome when he's writing this letter. And in Acts 28, we learn that he's under house arrest at his own expense. He has rent to pay. He has food and drink to buy. He has costs and he doesn't have any income. So he is actually, in one sense, very much in need. But Paul wants the Philippians to know that his joy is not connected to his circumstances. It's not that before the gift came, he was fretful and anxious because he didn't know how he's going to put a roof over his head. But now he's happy and settled because the money's come in. No, not at all. Look again at verse 11. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Paul is saying that he's learned something, a great secret, and something I think we'd all like to achieve, contentment. He says, I have learned contentment. This has been put to the test in Paul's life. He's been rich without being anxious about losing his money. He's been poor without being worried about where his next meal is coming from. How? Where did he get this contentment from? There's actually a whole industry that promises contentment in this life. You can go on Amazon, as I did this week, and uh, find lots of books that promise us. For example, uh, there's one that gave four steps to contentment and three keys to staying there. I didn't buy that one. Got Philippines. But uh, it, it's there. Sounds good, doesn't it? We have programs to train us in uh, mindfulness and self-reliance and resilience and inner peace. But Paul has not learned this through a program or through believing in himself or through delving into his own inner reserves of resilience. No, he has learned this contentment through a relationship. Look at verse 13. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. His contentment is independent from circumstances because it is dependent on God's. Now, we've got to note here, Paul is not saying that because he's a Christian, he can literally do anything, that he has sort of superhuman reserves of strength which can be called upon so that when he's poor, he finds he miraculously no longer needs to eat or anything like that. That's not what he's saying. It's a bit silly. What he is saying is that in the changing circumstances of life, whatever 
comes his way, whatever he's got in front of him, he has a relationship with the Lord Jesus that does not change. That's the point. As he says later in the passage, God has given him glorious riches in union with Jesus. And we've seen some of those throughout Philippians. We've seen just in the last few weeks that he has a righteousness that is not his own. He has a hope that will never fade. He has a God who answers prayer and the list goes on. And so in the gospel, in his relationship with Jesus, he has all the resources he needs to face any situation with a sense of calmness and contentment and godliness. Paul is clearly growing in this. He is learning this. It's not automatic or immediate, but let's think about what this might look like. So when he is financially rich, his union with Jesus teaches him and strengthens him not to rely on riches, not to trust in them, not to fear their removal. Why? Because he already has the riches of God's glory in Christ. He has a relationship with God that money can't buy. He doesn't need money to make him happy, but he can freely give it away. What about when he's financially poor? Well, his union with Jesus teaches him and strengthens him not to fret and worry about that because he has a father in heaven who supplies his every need. He has a relationship with God that money can't buy. Even if he dies, he has a wonderful future ahead of him. See, if you ever make financial investments, you're always warned that the value of your investment will go, might go down as well as up. There's always a risk, isn't there, in putting your money into a project because circumstances may change. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. His death and resurrection and ascension into heaven are unchangeable facts of history. And the blessings of Jesus are all the resources we need to be content in shifting circumstances. And so Paul is all in for Jesus, just like the Philippians are. He's all in financially and physically and emotionally. He's all of his eggs are in Jesus' basket. But that doesn't, as we might suspect, make him anxious because there's no safer place they could be. This is an investment that will always pay off. And so Paul and all who imitate him can learn, can grow in this contentment by being all in for Jesus because God strengthens us. And secondly, being all in for Jesus brings not just contentment, but joy, because God outgives us. Look at verse 14 with me. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Now, it's worth uh, noting here that Paul says, has said he's content whatever the circumstances, but that isn't because he's got some sort of Zen-like detachment from the real world, so he just sort of floats through life. No, he's still very grateful to be provided for. He still has needs and they need to be met. Poverty and hunger are not good things in the Bible, nor is gospel ministry being hindered through a lack of funds. That's not good either. If Paul needed money to get a ship over to a place where Jesus is not known or to pay his rent so he can keep telling the Roman guards about the gospel and he's running short, he's not going to sort of shrug and think, ah, well, never mind. No, he's just going to ask. He's going to ask for help. And the Philippians have answered time and time again. Even in his imprisonment, remember that his focus is on its effectiveness for the gospel of Jesus. Paul is all in on mission for Jesus and the Philippians are all in too. Yet still, Paul is not rejoicing primarily because he's received money for the spread of the gospel. Wonderful though that is. He's asked for that, he's received it, that money is being used to uh, talk to the Roman guards about Jesus. This is all going well. But that is not actually the fundamental reason why He's rejoicing. He has an even bigger and better reason to rejoice. Verse 17, not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. You see, Paul is making it clear that he's not sort of subtly angling for another contribution to the mission fund. Oh, so grateful for your gift. It's really good. Do that again? No, he's not doing that. He's grateful for the money. It will be used for gospel purposes, He's happy to ask and happy to ask again, and he's very, very grateful for it. But he's not primarily after the Philippians' money. 
That's not why he's writing to them. It's not why he's commending them for their gospel partnership. It's not why he's rejoicing at their generosity. He's rejoicing because of what God is doing in their hearts. He's rejoicing because they, as they give to him, it shows that God has given to them. It's fitting, I suppose, that Paul uses a financial metaphor here. They have emptied their accounts for him, but Paul says, actually, your account is filling up. Let's be slightly careful here. We mustn't push this metaphor too far. Paul isn't saying that by giving money, God is filling their spiritual account, as if by giving money, they become more right with God or earn salvation or anything horrific or blasphemous like that. Salvation is by God's grace alone. Remember, Paul has already given God all the credit for uh, the Philippians' right standing with them. He said back in chapter 1, verse 6, that God has begun this work, good work in them, and God will bring it to completion at the end. So there's no sense that by giving money, they are growing in their right standing with God. That's a wrong and false idea. Rather, Paul sees in their giving an answer to prayer. Let me remind you what Paul has been praying for the Philippians. If you turn back a page with me to chapter 1, verse 9, and we can see what Paul's big prayer is for the Philippians, what his goal is for them, what his hopes and dreams are for this church. He says, chapter 1, verse 9, This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is what Paul is praying for The Philippians, he's praying for the growth of the Christians in Philippi. He wants them to abound in love. He wants them to discern what is best. He wants them to make good and wise and loving decisions. He wants them to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. That is, increasingly to do the right thing, to do what pleases God, to be like Jesus, to love what God loves, to align their lives with his purposes. Well, here in this financial gift, is ample evidence that this prayer is being answered. The Philippians are abounding in love for Paul. They're abounding in love for Jesus. They're abounding in love for the lost people who need to hear the gospel. They're making wise decisions based on that love. They're using their money for something very, very important. They're sacrificing their money for the sake of others, for the sake of the gospel. They're getting behind God's mission. There's no better use for that money. To give like this is sure evidence that God has been at work in their hearts. Evidence indeed of the gift of the gospel. So it's no wonder that Paul earlier on saying, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord. He's not using hyperbole. He's not going over the top. He's saying, this is incredible. This is exactly what I've been hoping and dreaming and praying for you. That God would so work in your hearts to transform you to be like Jesus. This is what this has all been about. And look, here we are. And there's evidence for it. He's not, he's not in it for their money. He's glad of the money and he'll use that money for the best purpose it could possibly be used for. But what he's really concerned about is to see people grow in their love for Jesus. To demonstrate that love in really obvious practical ways. That is thrilling to him. And so this giving of the Philippians is itself a gift from God. It's part of the gift of growing ever more like the Lord Jesus, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, being ever more closely involved in his purposes and conformed to his character. Remember Jesus' words, it is more blessed to give than to receive, and that's because giving itself is a gift. As we let go of the things of this world in service of Jesus, we are given the gift of being more like our Lord who gave up everything for us. And that's what Paul is looking for. This is what he's rejoicing in, not in the Philippians' money, but in the Philippians' growth. And by rejoicing in that, he encourages them to rejoice in it too. Earlier, we considered that we might feel as though we're missing out by being all in. For Jesus, we might have less money or less time or a less comfortable life. But I think if you ask anyone in this church family, which decisions in your life do you regret? That would, you know, amp up the post-coffee, the post-church discussion, wouldn't it? Let's get straight in there. Forget the chit-chat. Um, what decisions in your life do you regret? I think you'll find the same kind of answer. The decisions I regret in my own life 
are the selfish ones. My self-service, my self-indulgence, these are the things that bring me shame and regret as I think back on them. The decisions I made by God's grace to do things for Jesus, to give my time, my money, myself to him, I don't regret those. I don't regret them for a minute. I wish I did that sort of thing more often, to be honest. David Livingston, the great uh, missionary to Botswana and other parts of Africa, spoke once to some Cambridge students about the sacrifices he'd made as a missionary to Africa. Here's what he said, it's on the screen. He said, for my own part, I have never ceased to rejoice that God has appointed me to such an office. People talk of the sacrifice I've made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Is that a sacrifice which brings its own blessed reward in healthful activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? Away with the word in such a view and with such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather, it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger now and then, with a foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life, may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall be revealed in and for us. I never made a sacrifice. Livingston's words take us to our final point, that being all in for Jesus leads to glory because God is for us. Look at verse 18. I have received full payment and even more. I'm amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, I just said that we never made a sacrifice. Then Paul tells us they made a sacrifice. What's going on there? We might be slightly surprised to hear Paul use that language, uh, to use the language of Old Testament sacrifice to describe the financial gift of the Philippians. We're used to thinking, I think, of all the Old Testament sacrifices, rightly, being fulfilled in Jesus' one sacrifice, his death on the cross, so that Christians no longer need to make sacrifices to make themselves right with God, and that's absolutely right. But within the Old Testament, there were sacrifices which could be made by God's people, which weren't about atonement and sin and guilt at all. They were instead about thanksgiving. They were called thanksgiving offerings or free will offerings, and they were about freely offering something to God simply because you were thankful and you loved him and you were delighted in him. They often involve cakes, actually, which I think is rather pleasing, and perhaps justifies our own church's slight obsession with them. Um, well, this is the same language here. The financial gift is like one of those free will offerings, something which simply pleases God and brings glory to him. I just want to pause there and think about that for a moment. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you might be quite comfortable, really, with the idea of pleasing God, of doing things which please God. But I just want us to pause and consider how unlikely that is. If you've been, um, sorry, we get a picture in the Bible of a God who is perfect and holy and good and pure, who cannot even look upon sin, and we get a picture of our own hearts as being very, very far from that, of being corrupted and impure and sinful, and I know that from my own experience. When we went on holiday recently, we listened to C.S. Lewis's um, Narnia series on audio CDs, and at the end of the silver chair, one of the Narnian characters essentially dies and goes to heaven, goes to Aslan's country, and he says he's always wanted to get a glimpse of this world, our world, and asks Aslan the lion whether that's wrong. And Aslan says to him, well, my son, now that you're here, you cannot want wrong things. Ah, oh, broke my heart, because I want wrong things all the time. I do the wrong thing, and I say the wrong thing, and I think the wrong thing to my own shame. By God's grace, there are areas that I'm making progress, but I'm increasingly aware, as I guess any of us are who are Christians, I'm increasingly aware about how sinful I actually am in every area of my life. But here, Paul says, you can do things that are pleasing to God, you know. You can do things that God delights in, that he loves, that he says great to 
because of Jesus' sacrifice, because of how we are brought into good relationship with God by grace, we can now do things for God that, that he sees as pleasing to him, like a fragrant offering, something he loves and delights in. You know, everything we do is going to be tainted by sin, of course, but in Christ that taint is removed and all that is left is the pleasing aroma of righteousness. And so if you are all in for Jesus, that idea ought to thrill your heart. As we're all in for Jesus and we, we live for him and we do things for him, we can do things that, crazy thought though this is, please the God of the entire universe, the holy and pure and perfect and sinless God, can be pleased by something that I do. I can bring glory to God. That is an extraordinary thought. But you might be thinking, especially if you're not yet a Christian, well, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to live your life doing things that please God and bring glory to him? Why please God when you can please yourself? Well, there is a fuller answer to that question, which lies beyond the scope of this one passage. As Christians, we believe that this whole universe exists for the glory of God. It is natural and right for every part of God's creation to give the credit and the honor to its creator. And so reordering our life to be all about the glory of God is to find once again our natural and right place in the universe. It's what we were created to be about. It's the most fitting and pleasing and harmonious way to live. But here Paul gives another part of the answer. Look at verse 19 again. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. We could imagine a world, I think, where a cruel tyrant had the power to just demand our obedience, where a needy ruler kept asking for glory from us and gave us nothing in return, where might was right. That might characterize some rulers in our world, or even some gods of false religions. But it does not characterize the gods who created this world, the Father of Jesus Christ. What does God do with his glorious riches? Does he hoard them to please himself and ask for more and more and more? No, he gives them to meet our needs. The reason that being all in for Jesus encourages us to live lives of generous giving and pleasing God rather than pleasing ourselves is because that is the character of God himself. He is a God of generous giving. It's what he's like. He's a God who loves to bless others. We've seen it back in Philippians 2 that Jesus Christ did not consider equality with God something to be grasped and used for himself and hoarded. No, he poured out his life to bless others. And the more all in you are for him, the more you're conformed to him and filled with the fruit of righteousness, the more you want to be like him and to give glory to him. And so as we reorder our lives to be about pleasing God rather than pleasing ourselves, as we reorder our lives to be about meeting other people's needs and meeting gospel needs, we find paradoxically, paradoxically verse 19, that all our needs are met. We might think that a life lived for the glory of God sounds a little bit off kilter, a little bit crazy, but actually it's the sanest, wisest way of life possible. You see, we could try and please ourselves. We can try and live a life where, which is all about us and all about meeting our own needs. But the paradox of that is we would never, ever get what we actually needed. What do we need? What do we need to live well? Paul, I think, is obviously including physical needs in this sentence. But as we think back over this teaching series, over the letters of the Philippians, we can recall that we have much, much deeper needs than that. We need to be freed from our selfish ambition. We need salvation from our sin and from God's judgment. We need to be freed from fear and anxiety. We need to be united with God and with his people. We need humility. We need the ability to press on towards our final goal. We need to be transformed into people who are like the Lord Jesus. And we need to stand firm in our faith. And we need to know that we have a good future ahead of us that God will one day transform our lowly bodies to be like Jesus' glorious body, that he will one day remove sin and suffering and strain and stress from our lives and from our worlds and usher us into his good new creation forever. That's what we need. We can't give ourselves what we need. You live a life for yourself, pleasing yourself, you won't get that. But being all in for Jesus 
means that he will meet that need in us. It's possible because God has given us in his son, the Lord Jesus, limitless resources to meet those needs. And because of his generous and good heart, he is willing to meet those needs. Being all in for Jesus leads to glory. It leads to God's glory and it leads to our appearing in glory, to our good future, because God is for us. And so as we conclude, let's think back that I, to that idea of obsession. You see, sometimes in our world, it actually does seem like obsession really is worth it. Paralympics ended this morning, so this is the, the final week I can get away with another Olympic illustration for a few years. Um, we are now used to seeing athletes standing at the side of the track or the pool with their gold medals around their necks, uh, talking to interviewers and saying things like, all the sacrifice was worth it. It was all worth it. All the early morning training sessions, all the missed parties, all the restrictive diets, it's all worth it for this. That's an obsession that sort of pays off, doesn't it? Now, I don't actually know whether they're right. I don't know if Olympic glory is really worth the sacrifice, and I certainly never will. Uh, but I do know that the glory of God is certainly worth being all in for Jesus. Now, you might be someone who's not yet a believer in Jesus and you're weighing up whether the Christian life is worth it, or you might be someone who is a Christian, but you know you're withholding part of your life from Jesus, your money perhaps, or your time, or a particular area of your life where Jesus really doesn't get a look in, or a cherished sin that you really don't want to get rid of. Whoever you are, I hope this morning has shown you that it is so worth being all in for Jesus. It is the sanest, wisest, most joyful and most contented life possible. And right at the end, Paul gives us one last reason to be all in for Jesus' mission. Look at verse 21. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. I can only imagine Paul grinning from ear to ear as he wrote verse 22, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Why those people particularly? And how did those in Caesar's household um, become followers of Jesus? Well, Caesar's household means probably more than his family. It would mean his staff as well. People like the soldiers guarding Paul in his house arrest those who had to stand guard over the Apostle Paul, who thought they were holding him captive, where in reality they were his captive audience as he spoke of Jesus, as some were converted, as the gospel spread through them, as it advanced to other areas as we read about in chapter 1. Those Roman guards and others like them who heard the gospel because Paul was able to pay his rent and pay his bills from the money sent by the Philippian church because of the prayers of the Philippian church. You see, if you were to ask the Philippians whether being all in for Jesus was worth it, I'm sure they would reply, absolutely. But there is another group of people you could ask. You could ask the members of Caesar's household who, uh, by God's grace, were brought to faith in Jesus through the Philippians' obsession with Christ. I can only imagine this. As Paul is writing his letter, we can imagine, can't we, perhaps a Roman soldier looking over his shoulder saying, oh, you're right, it's the Philippians. Brilliant. Please say hello from me. And please say thank you. I don't know how God will use us as a church over the next year. It's going to be a year of sacrifice for us, as it always is, as we give ourselves to the work of the kingdom, as we share the gospel with our city, as we, Lord willing, crack on with an expensive building project. But it will certainly be worth it. And my prayer is that there will be many in our city who this time next year will be in this building greeting us as newly minted brothers and sisters in Christ who will agree with us that our being all in for Jesus was certainly worth it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that as a church, our love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that we may be able to discern what is best, so that we may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, 
so that we may be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. In Jesus' name, amen.